I don't know about you, but when I was a kid and playing rock, paper, scissors, occasionally I would throw in some dynamite. <laughs> Seems like I was always looking for conflict. Well, we are a society of likes. We choose to do things we like, we like things on Facebook, we spend time with like-minded people. Sounds like a great system to generally get along and develop deeper connections, but what if all we're seeing is everyone's highlight reel? What if being a society of likes is actually causing us to drift further apart than develop these deeper relationships and connections? What if it's causing us to create more elephants in the room than we can handle? Unless we are extraordinarily self-aware, how could it not make us feel worse to spend part of our time pretending to be happier than we are and the other part of our time seeing others that seem to be happier than us? Yeah, I've heard that said about Facebook, but I've actually experienced it just in life, in meetings, in workshops, where clients and colleagues seem to have it all together. And this can be both inspiring and depressing. But there's always a backstory. We just don't always know about it. So today, I'm going to tell you four stories. One about me, two about what I do, and one that you've already heard today. So I'm a user experience architect. That means that I research, plan, and design experiences for the web. Basically, I'm a fancy web designer. And I do this by focusing in on people, not technology. Sure, the web is technology, but it's about the people. The internet was created to connect people to people, not machines to machines. So what I'm going to tell you about today is a methodology that I use to find those deeper connection points. And I would like to challenge you to think about this in your own context, not just mine and the stories I tell, but your stories and how it can apply to you. Make it yours. So it's exciting for me to work on the web, because these devices in our pockets and purses have changed how we communicate as much as the printing press did over a thousand years ago. Let me give you a brief history lesson of the web. So before the internet, does anybody here know what it was called? Just shout it out if you do. The ARPANET. Yes, it was the ARPANET. You win a prize. I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> in 1969, there were these four connection points, one in Utah and three in California. So that's right, the internet started in Utah. <laughs> and just four years later, it went slightly global. You can see how it's expanded in 1973. We see London and Sweden on there via satellite. And then in 1984, while it had been controlled by the military to this point, they realized that that wasn't its future. This network of networks needed to go public. And so this is when it started to become the internet and go to places like UBC. And then in 1993, it went truly global. But one year later, something very important happened on the internet. I arrived. <laughs> 1994 is when I started to use that, and it was the first year I went to university. In 2003, opte.org did a visualization of all the connection points on the internet, and they repeated this in 2010. If you look closer at this, this represents all the connection points, all the different lines, colors, dots, everything on here. And it's so complex to print this off that it costs $1,000 just to print. I spend my time listening to people, not listening to technology, so that I can decipher what it is to have a great experience online through a website, service, or product. Often this looks like me asking four basic questions, either in a one-on-one -on -one setting or sometimes in a workshop, in a group setting. These are what do you do, what's painful, what do you love, and what do you wish? These four questions create space for people to open up. Everyone can talk about what they do. That's natural. And most people are keen to talk about their struggles, what's painful, and what they love, and what they wish. And often we want to jump forward to the positive, but it's important for us to stay there for a moment and listen to people's struggles. They're important. We need to be heard. Once that's out of their system, however, though, it's good to talk about what they love. Everyone has something that they love, whether that's in their life, their job, their relationships, or in this case, perhaps the organization and their website. And then we can talk about their wishes, their dreams. And what begins to emerge is a strangely random storyline that starts us on our journey. People have shared their hearts and minds, and I've spent time listening for 
what if? And once this foundation is set, we can begin to see the real story. So the key to developing these great experiences and these deeper connection points in our lives is the conflict that goes through our stories. In some ways, it's my job to mine for that conflict and actually to be a design therapist. And I like to do this face-to-face where the team is all together in a room. And we might spend as much time as we can, one, two, three days, maybe more. I do this in a workshop setting where it forces us to make tough decisions, whether that's about the priorities of our content that will go on the website or the new design system. Haha, it's me again. Um, Let me tell you a story about what I do. Because I promised I would. In 2010, 2011, I worked for the government of Alberta, doing a project for them. Now, Alberta is by far the wealthiest province in Canada per capita. In fact, twice as wealthy as British Columbia. Let me put that in perspective for you. Their fifth largest industry is tourism, which brings in approximately $10 billion per year. This for a province of 3 million people also the oil and gas capital of Canada. Now, they have an immigration ministry and website there that helps people understand how to come to Alberta, Canada, and they were facing a challenge. They knew that within a relatively short amount of time, because of all the jobs that they had there and money, they were going to have a 150,000 person worker shortage. And they needed to reach out, not just nationally to other provinces, but globally. And they found that a lot of people from other countries were coming to this website on mobile devices, even back in 2009, 2010. The problem was the website wasn't optimized for mobile at all. And in fact, one of the key features for learning about Alberta was built entirely in Flash, making it totally inaccessible to all uh, Apple devices and very unusable on the rest. Not good. So I arrived, and I started to ask those four questions. What do you do? What's painful? What do you love, and what do you wish? And very early, one of the stakeholders told me this. We want to make it more difficult. So I laughed, as you would at that moment, and then I realized they were serious. Wait, what? Until a minute ago, you were a good person. (laughs) I was mystified. I just couldn't understand. But I turned quickly to my user experience training and started to ladder, that is to ask why, like a child would, over and over and over until you finally arrive at the real answer. And this continued on for too long. It took us a long time. We're not talking the same meeting, we're talking weeks. And finally, someone said, we have people coming to our province that have to leave because they can't be successful. It's not that they did anything wrong, they just couldn't adapt. They couldn't adapt to the culture, they couldn't adapt to the climate sometimes. They didn't necessarily have the right skills They couldn't learn the language. And so they had to leave because they couldn't be successful. It was a heartbreaking confession. I wish they had led with that, but it was buried under confusion and embarrassment. So after mining through this conflict, what we uncovered was they didn't actually want to say, we want to make it more difficult. What they were saying is, we want people to know what it takes to come to our province and to be successful and to thrive here. Doesn't that sound a little better? So, people were struggling with this website. Really struggling with it. And we're talking skilled workers here, doctors, nurses, engineers, people that had trained much of their adult life to be experts in their field were struggling with a website. And while some of the stakeholders still thought they wanted to make it more difficult, almost like this test to come to Canada through the website, get through the website, you pass the test, Yeah, it seems ridiculous, but this happens, right? I invited them to come with me and observe people using the website. And so we did. We watched as these skilled workers, these doctors and engineers, struggled to use a website, struggled to understand the language, the flow, the storyline of what it took to come to Alberta. And very quickly they saw that usernames are people, that these skilled laborers are people, and that day their hearts grew three times three sizes larger, (laughs) and they realized they wanted to tell the right story, not to make it more difficult. While I'm very proud of how the project turned out, I couldn't help but think it could have been done better. It simply took far too long for us to uncover this conflict. 
Every project has a timeline and a budget. A finite amount of money and a time it has to go live, no matter how big your organization is. And so I vowed to never do it this way again. It just simply took too long. Let me tell you another story about what I do. Later on in that same province, I was asked to lead a redesign of a website for the city of Red Deer, a municipality south of Edmonton, north of Calgary. Now, they had had their website for 11 years, which is basically forever on the internet. And the city residents and businesses had lost trust in this website. It was just so hard to use. It had grown and just into this Frankenstein beast over the years. And so, reasonably, the team at the city of Red Deer was excited about all the new features, the bells and whistles that they would be developing for good, with good intentions for this audience. But I knew that there had to be conflict that was running through their story underneath. Otherwise, they would have moved forward earlier. And I didn't want to have a repeat of how long it took on the Alberta project. So what we needed on the Alberta project and what we did use here was a framework, a safe place to address the conflict early. Those four questions are key in us opening up but we also need a safe environment to do that with. So let me tell you a little bit about this framework, but honestly, you can apply it to anything, to relationships, to other business practices, to your own lives. So think about it that way. But I want to put you in the room with us at the city of Red Deer, so I'm going to tell you the four parts of the framework. People, the audiences. Now we're talking about the people that will be using this website in this case, because the internet, as we heard, is all about connecting people to people. So we talk about who they really are. We don't make up fake personas for them. It's who they actually are and what they really need. And we keep that out in front of us as our primary thing throughout the entire project. The second thing is the vision, the user experience vision, where we're trying to head. And there's this tension between the vision and the reality. And there's that overlap and that constant tension pulling us forward towards the vision. We'll probably never get to the vision, and that's good, because it should be that hard, but we should always be moving forward. The third thing are our design principles. These are kind of the why statements. These are sort of the values of our project. Some of them for the city of Red Deer were to make it accessible to all, so that anybody could use it on any device, regardless of sighted issues or motion issues. But also, perhaps, the way it's coded. These could be our design principles. And then goals. We need to have goals, the things we can measure. But we always want to jump forward to these things, the things that we know and feel more comfortable with. And it's important for us to stop and to struggle with the why, to answer that question first. For us to see the why first allows us to have everything else fall into place. So let's not jump to the goals first. But those are the four things in this framework that we needed to have a safe place to find and address conflict. So with the city of Red Deer, we did lock ourselves into a room uh, for three days. And we had food brought in, and we sketched out all our ideas. We covered every inch of this room with stick it, uh, post-it notes. We covered every whiteboard, constantly taking pictures, erasing things, and putting them up. And we used active listening, so that when someone would say something or not say something, and I could see that there was a misunderstanding, I would stop and say, let's sketch that out. Please repeat it. What does that concept actually look like? Why is it important? We would have times where we would just be staring at the floor in depression, basically, <laughs> or at each other in frustration and anger. And it's okay to sit in those moments for a little bit, right? because we're bonding as a team right now. But we need to move past it. So that's part of my role in mining for conflict. So someone would say, hey, you said this was priority one. You said it was priority three. Why? Let's talk about this. Let's sketch it out. And in every case, we reached agreement. I never look for compromise. I always look for agreement in this workshop setting. Because compromise is relatively easy to arrive at. But it means that the conflict continues underneath the surface. It festers. And because we didn't agree when we were together, it creates this deteriorated experience later on. So this website that we create might not be the best we could have been, which impacts perhaps everyone living in this entire city. Or if we think about the Alberta project, everybody thinking about moving to Alberta. It's my job to mine for conflict. Otherwise, we'll miss the chance to make something perhaps the best it could be. We'll also miss the opportunity to bond as a team if we don't go through this conflict. 
Fighting through these tough moments is a key to getting to know each other and to becoming a true team. It's magical. Okay, a story that we've already heard today. So when I first heard Jeff a few months ago talk about his subject, I felt really naive. If we took all the cars in the entire world and combined their pollution, it equaled that of the 15 largest ships in the world. I felt so naive, and perhaps a little better about littering. No, I didn't. Um, I'm like Jeff. I do what I can, but I thought, how can I live in Vancouver and not know about this? How naive I am. But then I started to ask why, and to ladder again, to think, why are we shipping so much stuff, such great distances? Let me tell you a little bit more about Singapore. We heard a little bit about that, and we saw the port. But did you know that Singapore has roughly 5.4 million people living there? In a space that's approximately the size of Vancouver, Delta, Richmond, and Burnaby, it is 50% more densely populated than the downtown core of Vancouver, making it the most densely populated country in the world. And the country doesn't have enough room for its agriculture. They ship in 90% of their food because there's no space to create it there. Now, while there is some solutions coming for this, hopefully, great architects and engineers and problem solvers are looking at floating farms that could bring the food closer to them, so we don't have to ship it as far. This is years off. They literally need the food shipped to them to stay alive, and no pun intended, to keep the country afloat. What about closer to home, though? If we took a look at our trees in Canada and in BC in particular, we have a lot of trees. Seven percent of the world's forested lands are in Canada, and they call them the lungs of the earth. And within those trees, we have a wood called hemlock. You might have heard of this. In fact, if you go to Home Depot, I was just rebuilding a railing at my house and found that hemlock is about 40 percent cheaper than oak. And I thought, 40 percent savings? I'm going for that. That's totally worth it, right? But Jeff alluded to this in his talk that sometimes, and in this case, we'll ship these goods. All the way across the Pacific Ocean, across to Asia, in this case to China, because we, our mills in North America, are too powerful. They rip the wood apart. But the mills that they're using in China and the labor costs there are cheaper for us. So they mill the wood, create these products, package it up, and ship it all the way back across the Pacific Ocean to North America, so that those products can land in Home Depot and we can have 40% cheaper wood. Yeah, <laughs> I just find this pretty depressing, right? But what if the problem isn't boats? As we heard, maybe the problem is shipping and our business practices. So, what if we took a look at this problem through the same framework and asked our four questions? Would we see it differently? So we took a look at our audiences. Sure, some countries need things shipped to them. People need their food, so emergency supplies. These things happen. But do I really need 40% cheaper wood at Home Depot? If our vision is to reduce the overall emissions throughout the world, is it better boats and business practices? Is it changing hearts and minds? The vision of this. If we took a look at our design principles, a couple examples could be create. Business practices and better ships, but how about problem solving for now and the future? And our goals—we always need things to measure. Right? Better boats will happen earlier, although it would probably take a decade for that to really start to be adopted. But what about a goal for the changing the hearts and minds? How do we do that? How do we change the business practice of the cheaper wood at Home Depot for us? When we move through this framework, we go from just being a society of likes to a society. That listens to the hearts and thoughts of others. We look for better and better solutions. Perhaps even someday we'll arrive at the best. So it's not really conflict that's the key to creating these wholehearted experiences. It's finding and addressing that conflict, and seeing how we can have the courage and vulnerability to go through this challenge.、It、allows us to become a team, to love one another, to create. True team that's trying to make a better world for all of us. So I'm going to continue to do this in the work that I do. Mining for conflict online through internet projects, and it's exciting for me. But I want to challenge all of you to discover how you can do this 
in what you are already doing, personally and professionally. Thank you.